VNR, we will be starting in uh, uh, two or three minutes. Can I request uh, all the panelists, please switch on your uh, video so we can have a photo before. Dr. Nazari. Smile, please, so we can have a group photo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will be. Now we will be uh, starting to uh, going to start our uh, program in uh, only five minutes. I'm just waiting for a uh, one panel, uh, one person. He will join us, and then we will start. Sorry for the delay. But you can understand they are in Pakistan today. There is a very heavy rain since the morning. So we are having rain and this is unusual rain.
بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹل مین اینڈ تھینک یو سو مچ فار اسپیرنگ یور ٹائم فرام یور بزی شیڈیول ٹو گیو فیو منٹس ان آر فیو منٹس ڈیفینیٹلی اٹس ٹو آور آور سیشن ٹو بی ہیئر ود اس ٹو ڈسکس اباؤٹ دا گلوبل سیکیورٹی انیشیٹو وائی وی آر آرگنائزنگ دس گلوبل سیکیورٹی انیشیٹو ویب انار اینڈ وی آر وائی وی آر ٹرائنگ ٹو انٹروڈیوس دس کنسیپٹ The answer is very simple. If we look around, the world is facing multiple challenges. When there are 828 million people, they are food insecure. There are 696 million, they are in the poverty trap. If just we increase the level of uh, the minimum requirement for the poverty, so if we increase it from $2 to $3.6 dollar, So the global poverty may be, the people will reach to the number of one, more than 1 billion people, 1.85 billion people. That is a huge number. And simultaneously, if we look around, so how many people they are displaced around the world? 89.3 million people, they are displaced. Post, the majority of them, they are the forcefully displaced people. Among them, 27.1 million, they are children under the age of the 18 and many of them people they don't have the nationality and then if we look around the, about the water availability 200 uh, 2 billion people they don't have access to the safe drinking water 3 billion people they don't have access to the hand washing facilities if we look around the total gdp of the world it is only 95.5 trillion but interestingly if we look around on the debt the global debt is 305 trillion us dollar that is very astonishing fact when once we have the income of 95 trillion dollar but we have to pay back the debt of 305 trillion dollar us dollar where this money will come and how it, that money has been ballooned to that number and if we look around an investment gap around the world that is a 5 15 trillion us dollar till 2040 that is the estimation for the global hub infrastructure and if we include this is the casting uh, casting for the climate change so that that, uh, that gap will increase may minimum two or three uh, three times more so that is beyond the capacity of the human in the presence of these all facts and the challenges why we are fighting why we are not cooperating i think in that context we need an initiative which can help us to secure peace and development simultaneously which talk about tradition and non tradition security threat equally So in this context, we feel like that, that this, this concept of the GSI, I will not deliberate more because speaker will be doing the justice to the topic. So I think in that context, if we look at the numbers around poverty, food insecurity, debt, global infrastructure gap, and the people who don't have access to the safe drinking water and the people don't have access to the energy, for example, for energy, around about seven, seven, 90, 790 million people don't have access to the reliable energy. and majority of them if we look around either is a food security water access or energy access or the poverty majority of the people are living in the third world in the south global south when we say in the sub saharan africa in certain part of the asia and latin america and caribbean and other parts so people are living there so that's why i think this initiative is very important and that's why we have organized this session to deliberate so how it can help the world in the coming days and with those remarks i would like to introduce our first speaker she is a very well known scholar and a activist and you can say anything but she is a passionate about the peace she is a leading different campaigns about the peace and the development i think you must have guessed the name madam helga laroche and she is a chairperson of shiller institute us and germany she is a leading so many campaigns for the peace and security i think he she is the best candidate to start with madam floor is yours well thank you very much for this kind introduction and i greet you very warmly uh, i think we are experiencing right now a dramatic change in the strategic situation suddenly the veil has been ripped away from what had been covered up as a simmering conflict between two diametrically opposed approaches in international relations which have been going on since a very long time 
on the one side, a method of international relations based on cooperation, mutual political benefit, consideration of the interest of the other, and an economic win-win approach. On the other side, building military alliances based on agreements of ruling elites to maintain their control and contain an imagined or real adversary while using proven methods of divide and conquer and plain military interventions. The venue where that difference has just dramatically been demonstrated is Southwest Asia, where through the brilliant mediation of China and its leading diplomat, Wang Yi, the decade-old rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia has just been resolved with the method of the Chinese proposed Global Security Initiative. With that, the imperial manipulation, which has tortured the region since the divisions of the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916, and especially since the coup d'etat against Prime Minister Mossadegh in 1953, has been ended, and the proxy conflict between the pro-Iranian and pro-Saudi forces in Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and even neighboring countries, and between the Shiite and Sunni followers will be overcome. The countries of Southwest Asia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, which all are gradients of civilization, which were once on the road to modernization, have been subjected to interventionist wars by the US, Great Britain, and NATO, suffering millions of deaths of civilians, millions of refugees, and were left as devastated countries. Now, with the rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the possibility exists for the extension of the Belt and Road Initiative from China to Pakistan via Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria to Turkey, and another uh, road to Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Egypt, and beyond into Africa. And this will represent the very real chance for an economic buildup of the entire war-torn region and a future economic miracle. The principle of peace through development, which has been the battle cry, if I can call it that way, of the Schiller Institute since four decades, is now being realized by China through a combination of the Global Security Initiative and the Global Development Initiative, because these two always have to go together. That is a tremendous victory for humanity and gives hope that soon 500 million people living in what the colonialists called the Near and Middle East will become a prosperous economic hub, hub between Asia, Europe, and Africa. This for almost everybody unexpected historic breakthrough mediated by China has not only given hope to the countries of the global South, where many still suffer from colonial manipulations, but it obviously gives tremendous momentum to the 12th principle peace plan, which for sure will be on the agenda when President Xi goes to Moscow next week for Ukraine. China has presented a, a resolution of the crisis with Ukraine. The prospect of an economic reconstruction of Ukraine after the implementation of the Chinese peace plan in the context of the BRI is the only human alternative to fighting this war until the last Ukrainian. The short-term danger that this NATO proxy war between Russia over Ukraine could cross red lines like the British proposed attempt to retake Crimea to cause a Cuban missile crisis on steroids, as the British have called it, and go out of, could go out of control and escalate into a global thermonuclear war. And that has many people around the world extremely worried, which has expressed itself in a lot of anti-war demonstrations in various countries, 
on both sides of the Atlantic. It has caused Pope Francis to offer the Vatican as the venue for peace negotiations. It has caused President Lula of Brazil to form a peace club of the countries of the global south, which he will present to President Xi when he visits China later this month, and many similar initiatives. But it is also clear that since a long time, the real reason for the war danger does not lie in anything having to do with Ukraine as such, but it lies in the inevitable pending collapse of the hopelessly bankrupt and over-indebted neoliberal financial system of the transatlantic region. It is apparent the apparent inability of that system to reform itself, which we just experienced these days in a traumatic turmoil on the financial markets, and thus regards the rise of China and the associated collaboration of the countries of the Global South with the Belt and Road Initiative as a mortal threat which has to be defeated. The renewed turmoil on the financial markets following the bankruptcy of the Silicon Valley Bank as a result of the relatively fast rise of the interest rates puts on the agenda the unsolvable dilemma between the skiller of quantitative tightening in an attempt to counter the hyperinflation caused by 15 years of reckless liquidity creation and economic madness such as the strangulating and boomeranging sanctions against Russia, Afghanistan, and many other countries, and in this way creating a chain reaction collapse of the entire system, and the charybdis of more quantitative easing and therefore a hyperinflationary devaluation of all assets, there is no solution within that system. Either of these two outcomes, a sudden collapse of a hyperinflationary blowout, or you know, uh, a collapse uh, as an immediate collapse, would increase the danger of an escalation into a world war. What is required, therefore, in my view, is the convening of an emergency conference by either the UN General Assembly or the G20, whereby the governments of the world would signal to the world that they will work together to move towards a new global security and development architecture, which will take into account the interest of every single country on the planet. There is a way to remedy the crisis. It would require that the countries of the West abandon the casino economy, move back to a system of investment into physical economy and energy flux dense forms of investment in order to increase the productivity of the economy. The four laws suggested by my late husband, Lyndon LaRouge, a global banking separation, a bankruptcy reorganization of the entire system, the implementation of national banks in every country, a new global credit system, essentially what Franklin D. Roosevelt did in 1933, but on a global scale, would solve the problem. At such an emergency conference, China should offer a combination of the Global Security Initi Initiative and the Global Development Initiative, namely a concrete development plan for all countries to join. If the UN General Assembly or the G20 are unable to put on the table such a grand design to overcome the gravest crisis in the history of mankind, then other sponsors must be found such as the BRICS Plus countries, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, the African Union, and other representative organizations representing what Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov has adequately called the global majority. They must speed up the attempt to create a new currency based on commodities and a credit system entirely devoted to the increase of the well-being of the people. When the fate of all of humanity is at stake, it is time for the countries of the global majority and all the people of goodwill to join in a powerful chorus for the establishment of a world economic and security order which serves the future of humanity. If the countries of the global majority all get together and demand a change towards a new paradigm, 
and collaborate with the countries of the Belt and Road Initiative, then I'm sure the West will have to think twice if it would not be in their best interest to also cooperate. Therefore, the combination of the Global Security Initiative and the Global Development Initiative must be put on the table now. And the new name for peace is development must be the battle cry of all of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for a very brief but a very comprehensive comments. I was expecting you will also educate us more about the stuff, but I will definitely come back to you. And now we will go along with our agenda. But keep in mind, I will come back to you because you have done so much under so you are uh, under threat for so many organizations. You are on the one of the top on the list of Ukraine and that there are propaganda and everything. So I will come back to you later. So our next speaker for the session is Mr. Ong Tiki. He is a chairman, Center for New and Inclusive Asia from Malaysia. He has a very good experience with the government of Malaysia and he worked for uh, uh, with China and on the Chinese issue and the Asia issue for a very long time. Sir, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, fellow panelists. Good afternoon. Well, this is indeed a very timely topic for our discussion today. And my response to the question is very largely from the Southeast Asian perspective. In the current security perspective, focusing of the global gaze on the Ukraine war and the military maneuver in continental Europe are of course understandable. But at the same time, South China Sea is no less a powder keg amid the escalating Sino-American geopolitical rivalry, thus making Southeast Asia one of the critical areas of security concern, alongside Middle East, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean and Pacific Island countries as are listed in the GSI concept paper. From the Chinese perspective, Mr. Chairman, both the Global Security Initiative or GSI and the Global Development Initiative, GDI, were rolled out in tandem, signifying the integration of security and development in China's global reach, global outreach that sees development as a basis for security and security as a condition for development. Indeed, there can be no sustainable development without peace and no peace without sustainable development. Mr. Chairman, these two initiatives are timely added to the list of public goods that China offers to the international community after the rollout of Belt and Road Initiative 10 years ago. The GSI is now rooted in the principle of indivisible security, calling for a common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security architecture for the world amid the escalating security risk. It pursues that no country can strengthen its own security at the expense of others with security concerns of all stakeholders be given due consideration on the premise of mutual respect, openness, and integration. By and large, Mr. Chairman, the lofty ideals of GSI have endeared China, the second largest economy in the world, to the international community, particularly the developing global south, which is generally in dire need of a peaceful environment for their development. Similarly, the Southeast Asian countries in my region generally subscribe to the GSI principles, especially the pursuit of comprehensive and cooperative security, respect of national sovereignty, and territorial integrity, sanctity of the UN Charter, 
peaceful settlement of disputes and efforts to address the security concerns in both the traditional and non-traditional domains. Mr. Chairman, nonetheless, the moralistic posturing and assuring affirmative support for ASEAN-centered regional security architecture and respect for the ASEAN's consensus building have yet to contribute much to allaying the prevailing misgiving against the executive big neighbor. Trust deficit in engaging with China on regional security risk remains real in the region. In this context, Mr. Chairman, the State of Southeast Asia survey for the year 2020 to 2023, which is a yearly opinion survey conducted by ISIS, the Yusuf Ishak Institute of Singapore, on the perception of China among ASEAN member states can perhaps help shed some light on the scenario. Mr. Chairman, while the Southeast Asians embrace China as a key economic partner in the region, as was manifested in the encouraging response on the Global Development Initiative, they remain skeptical of China's role as, as the security provider. The reception of GSI among the ASEAN member states remains somewhat ambivalent. Taking cognizant of their past experience, their past dependence on the US in addressing regional security rules, one could easily attribute such ambivalence to the traditional hedging approach adopted by the respective ASEAN countries in engaging with China in the face of heightening US-China geopolitical rivalry. Mr. Chairman, the juxtaposition of embracing China's economic might on one hand and distrustful of China's security role on the other hand by the ASEAN countries owes much to the protracted overlapping claims over territorial waters in South China Sea, notably over the Nine Dash Line controversy. The inconclusive negotiation on the code of conduct over South China Sea over the past 20 years, after the declaration on the conduct of parties in the South China Sea, or in short, we call that DOC, renders the trust deficit a further disservice. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, be that as it may, China's commitment to signing off on the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaty without any reservation remains a laudable move in Southeast Asia and even the world. It is the only nuclear weapon state that has proactively made such a declaration in the interest of pursuing regional and world peace. Its consistency in forsaking the use of nuclear arms has drawn another round of international applause from its affirmation in the GSI that, uh, and I quote, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, unquote. This has catapulted China to a higher moral ground, notably when the Ukraine war has dragged the world to the brink of nuclear Armageddon. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, while the rollout of GSI was greeted with warm response progressively worldwide, the skeptics remain wary of the alleged hidden agenda of China, purportedly designed to supplant the US primacy amid the waning Pax Americana. Under such perspective, the new security governance brought about by the GSI is viewed as a move to change the existing world order 
though China has repeatedly reiterated that GSI framework is UN-centric, it chooses to target no country, and the security architecture therein is dedicated to all embracing. Understandably, Mr. Chairman, the trajectory of GSI, the trajectory of GSI is not going to be easy. Definitely, it is not going to be easy, but it is not without low lying fruits, as I can see. Low lying fruits, what I mean is the GSI can still gain traction in the non traditional and non military domains, ranging from food security, energy security, environment security, trans border crime to terrorism. And perhaps these are the areas we can begin with in pursuing the course of GSI. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time and patience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owen Keith. I think you put a very, you put very beautifully the perspective from the ASEAN. And I think it will help us to more understand and think deeply. So I think that is a very timely reminder from ASEAN. And uh, definitely China, when we're presenting, they will miss, be thinking about these lines also. But thank you for your uh, uh, comprehensive speech. And given the perspective, we, during the question and answer session, we will come back to you. Now, our next speaker, and uh, you have already mentioned about Ukraine, Russia, and other things. So I think our next speaker will perfectly match to the, our list. Miss Julia Melenikov, hope I pronounce the right name because it's uh, maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, please correct me. She is a program manager, Asia Pacific, Russian International Affairs Council. They are responsible for most of the international relations work and research thing in the Russia. So ma'am, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's indeed a great honor today. Uh, quite a lot has been said already uh, about the initiative per se. So probably um, what I might offer here is a sort of a strategic perspective into what this initiative means in terms of China's rise and the way it's seen or can be seen uh, from our point of view from here, from Moscow. Uh, so like Definitely, like one of the questions for our event was about philosophy and rationale behind the initiative. And uh, if we look into that, uh, obviously, the ongoing transformation of the global order is something that we are all um, in the middle of. And um, we might only guess what kind of balance of power might underpin the uh, future configuration of the world order, but we definitely are sure that China has a huge role to play. And knowing that uh, China is evidently stepping up its efforts into framing its own global approach. And Global Security Initiative is one of the most important steps uh, on this path. Uh, and here is why, like if we speak from the realist perspective, if we take the realist approach, uh, we know that great powers are the powers that shape the global order. And if we take one of the versions that is uh, quite widespread in Russia of realism, so one of the factors uh, that make great power great power uh, is not just resources, be they military or economic or ideological, but also uh, the ability and will to think and act globally and to take global responsibility. And this is what we see China doing more and more efficiently these days. And this is actually what uh, once alarms, or at, I don't know, depending on the side, like either alarmed or uh, encouraged a global community uh, back in the second half of the previous decade when China announced its global responsibilities, preparedness for global mm -hmm. responsibility at one of the party congresses. So that was the awakening moment for the global community, for the West, for the global South, I believe for everyone. Uh, that China was ready, and then uh, a series of initiatives was put into place. And uh, as we see, the initiatives that China proposes uh, come exactly at the moment when 
particular spheres are in turmoil. So like we saw the Belt and Road Initiative coming up after the global economic crisis when uh, global economic architecture was uh, a fluid. So China offered its vision, a comprehensive one of how it could be transformed. Uh, then we also saw the concept of the shared uh, destiny of the mankind, of the humankind, which is rather ideological, like a little bit more discursive than uh, Belt and Road, but way more discursive than Belt and Road, but still it uh, sort of tried to fill in the void uh, and uh, opposed to hegemony and uh, other concepts that are not uh, inclusive. Uh, and then uh, a lot has been said already today by the marvelous speakers that I'm honored to hear about this development security nexus and about global development initiative and global security initiative that might and should go hand in hand. So we see the second component coming up now. So like exactly as Belt and Road addressed the economic turmoil, global security initiative is aimed at addressing security turmoil that we are currently experiencing and are unfortunate uh, to well, leave during. And um, so this initiative is an exact statement yeah, that China wants to take its part. The strong points are, and I agree with the speakers who have already expressed their positions mm -hmm. is this exact global uh, development security nexus that uh, will help China to promote its interests and to secure its actual influence as a great power in the world because the like, development issues have, have always played a huge role in China's foreign policy. Another strong point is probably a strong point for China as a global contender, right, as the rise power of today, uh, is the interlinkage between internal and external security dimensions because the initiative actually links these two things together. It speaks about comprehensive security as something that uh, the world and countries should pursue and like comprehensive in terms that domestic unrest uh, and global unrest can go hand in hand. And this is the thing for global south, this is the thing for many countries beyond the global south. So this is something that China might um, label its own thing, uh, its own agenda as a global power. And it also determines priority regions. So it determines the regions where China might build it's subsystem because like if you are a great power you need to have a regional subsystem and uh, where this might be we can see it in the strategy so the approach that china offers here is indeed holistic i think we've talked about this already and uh, this is how it can be seen from any point in the world like including russia so it's indeed holistic but it also has its weak points and weak points is the how aspect actually but where we need a little bit more time to see this materialize or not materialize because like the how question it also has dimensions and the first dimension of the how question to my mind is uh, exactly instruments so like china is traditionally strong in peacekeeping like it's been active in the united nations and it has been contributing a lot to the un uh, peacekeeping efforts and now we see china stepping up its efforts as a conflict mediator which is an important thing to do for a global power, but, and we have just seen the successful uh, brokering process between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And um, I believe many were quite surprised um, that it actually worked out, but it did. And so we can uh, count it as a success for China, but uh, the peace plan for Ukraine. So we are still to expect something yeah so uh the president she's visit to moscow next week uh, will probably uncover and unveil uh how this might turn out but um uh, we don't still see this quite successful series of uh, conflict mediation events but like the conflicts are very complex we understand that of course but this is the how part that um we are yet can't be sure about like because we don't know how the initiatives how the initiative will work out um, and how these uh, proposals can be implemented because uh, the peace proposals uh, around the crisis were labeled by the West as lofty and empty. They were cautiously met in Russia and uh, other countries uh, of uh, like global south. Um, and we still don't see like 
if they might work or they don't. And that's probably for President Xi and President Putin to decide next week, but uh, we can just wait and see here. And so like the more complex the situation gets, uh, the more tricky it is uh, actually to implement any strategies. So although we of course welcome the initiative, uh, we believe that there is still something to expect and in particular to see how China with its global security proposals might address regional security issues and uh, how effective its strategy might be in terms of uh, organizing and maintaining its own regional subsystem if we are uh, to expect China to become like, the rising power and the great power of the next uh, configuration of the world order. And in this regard, in fact, like uh, several other questions remain, like whether the regional subsystem of China is to be formed somewhere around the priority regions in the Global Security Initiative or whether it is somewhere else. And here, actually, the EU-China relations is one of the most vivid examples of why multipolarity is difficult to maintain from both sides, because China has been investing a lot, I mean, both uh, discursively, ideologically, and economically, into developing this um, independent and solid bond with the EU. So it has been a process going on since uh, late 90s into today, but, and the EU was also interested at the beginning. So the relations having their own dynamics separate from China-Russia dynamics and the US-the EU dynamics was a thing. So it was a marker of multipolarity, it was a marker of China's growing uh, role everywhere. But uh, today we see that the relations, the relations are facing their difficulties as well. Mm, for understandable reasons. And this is also one of the markers and the examples that the strategies are not always easy to be put into practice. Uh, but so summing it up, because I'm afraid that I'm speaking for way too long already, it sounds like that. Um, I would probably just want to add that uh, really do see China becoming more and more worthy of like, you know, worthy, but like more and more active as a global power of today, but um, we hope that the strategies will actually um, get their practical implementation and practical foundation uh, in the nearest future and in the years to come. So thank you. That would probably be from me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Julia, for uh, introducing the perspective from uh, Russia. So how you are looking at uh, global security initiatives and i think russia can also play a very good role to promote the cause so uh, now we are moving to our next speaker moving from southeast asian to russia not to going back to the europe so our next speaker is mr stephen brawl he is a chairman of belt and road initiative institute sweden sir floor is yours <clears throat> Sir, please unmute. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> honored uh, speakers. <clears throat> I uh, am happy to, uh, to greet you uh, on behalf of uh, this uh, extremely historic uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is actually celebrating its 10th year uh, this year, 2023, it's the uh, jubileum or celebration of the Belt and Road. <clears throat> and the Belt and Road has uh, a international significance, which uh, is now embracing more than 150 countries, including the fact that it has even uh, been reported, I believe, that uh, a new interest in the Belt and Road is now coming from Mexico. Uh, this means that the great majority of the world has uh, already understood uh, in many ways the foundation for why uh, working with the Belt and Road is a uh, necessary direction for maintaining a positive future for mankind. Uh, the 
reality of uh, what actually constitutes the Belt and Road, which I'm sure most of the uh, participants here know. However, it's important to underline is the development of infrastructure. Infrastructure constitutes the basis for eliminating global poverty. If you do not develop infrastructure in a modern form, then the necessary development of uh, water systems, transport, uh, do not go forward. <clears throat> and this notion is central to the concept of the Belt and Road as an initiative for cooperation among all nations. That, that is the context in which it was initiated. Uh, this constitutes a foundation of what real economy is actually about, which is not simply finance or money. Uh, it's about physical, uh, uh, physical economy. Uh, the basis upon which we can look at uh, the status of things I will briefly mention is that uh, these are statistics which now come from the United Nations Statistics Division. Uh, China is the world's manufacturing superpower. They are now constituting, and this is output manufacturing from 2019, according to the United Nations Statistics Division, almost, uh, well, 29% of the top 10 countries with the United States quite far behind by 16.8. And then you have Japan 7.5 uh, and Germany down to 5.3 in terms of global manufacturing. Uh, this is uh, a very indicative uh, indication of physical economy. This is what makes China and the Belt and Road Initiative the future basis for peace and development. The Global Security Initiative and the Global Development Initiative have emerged uh, partly out of the Belt and Road Initiative and the failure of Western uh, Europe and the United States to accept the hand of cooperation and development. Uh, that necessarily needs to change if we are going to achieve a, a direction in the world that will constitute <clears throat> security and development for all nations. Uh, but this concept of physical economy has a fundamental basis in it because the, um, if we look at one other side of things, which I think is relevant to mention, it's the, uh, the role of uh, China also in, uh, in terms of uh, exports. They are now exporting 3,63 uh, 3 trillion dollars in, uh, in exports internationally right now. The United States uh, is only 1.75. These are also statistics that are coming from uh, statistical sources around the United Nations Statistical Bureau. Uh, Germany, 1.631 trillion. This means, interestingly enough, that China in its exports is already basically ahead of the United States and Germany combined. That is a direction which constitutes the foundation for how one can go forward uh, with economic cooperation as a basis for uh, mankind's future role. As Xi Jinping emphasized in the initiative, a community for a shared future for mankind. That is something that is virtually not mentioned in any of the Western reporting to the degree that they even report anything about the Belt and Road. From here in Sweden, uh, I am a, <clears throat> happen to be an American Swede. My background is actually having 
been born and raised in the United States. The problem that we have in Sweden with the refusal on the part of the general position of the government and the position even more extreme in the United States to simply dismiss the initiative and to demonize China as if they are out to uh, achieve world domination. So why I, I mention these figures is there is a underlying, as Mrs. LaRouche mentioned, an extreme incompetence in the way that Western, uh, the Western payment system and financial system has been uh, uh, based and it is disintegrating. Now that presents the danger that the world is facing right now, a, a grave danger and a threat, certainly around the conflict in Ukraine, uh, <clears throat> but additionally, uh, moves that are being made by the same uh, the same participants, characters, AUKUS, that is attempting to play geopolitical games in the uh, in uh, the uh, Pacific region. So, I think that from the vantage point of the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, we, we are actually working beyond the boundaries of Sweden to embrace all of Europe as a way of uh, raising the uh, in, intention of what Xi Jinping has pointed out and why it is in the interest of not alone Sweden, but Europe and the United States to restructure and rethink their economic planning based on the kind of physical economic principles that, uh, that are fundamentally behind China's rise as a global power and constitutes now the 10th year and, and, and celebration, which is being embraced by the great majority of countries in the world. But we have to find the ways to bring the rest of the world that at the moment has rejected cooperation and friendship to join that. So I work from that standpoint as chairman of the Belt and Road, and I encourage everyone to join with that perspective and support uh, the objectives of the Global Security Initiative, which clearly reflect the same in this, uh, thinking of what the Belt and Road has been about. So I will uh, leave it at that for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Mr. Stephen, for your Thank comments. You. And I think you are always very brief. I attended so many conferences with you. You are very brief. I want to talk about the facts and uh, figures. Before I invite our next speaker from Afghanistan, I just want to introduce our one of uh, a friend from China Embassy in Pakistan, Mr. Li Chang. He has joined us and um, he is also very keen about the security initiative, uh, global security initiative of China. Mm -hmm. And definitely he will get the point of view from all our friends who are describing. And uh, the good thing I noted during the last, uh, during my work, I'm working on the China issue for the one more than one decade, but during the last few years, I have uh, witnessed China is uh, opening more to the critical analysis. And they are very much receptive about what is being said. And they want to take it as a positive contribution to refine the initiatives. And thank you so much, Li Zhang, for joining us. And um, now our next speaker is Dr. Abdul Latif Nazari Sahib. He is a Deputy Minister of Economy of Afghanistan. Although he is a very busy person, and you can understand from his position, but he is a very keen for, for strengthening working on China and the relationship. Even he joined us our previously, he joined us for our youth meeting, and he delivered a very good lecture on the youth meeting. Also, he is a very dynamic. Dr. Abdul Latif Nazarisa, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Do you have my voice? Yes, we can hear you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, 
China's Global Security Initiative document plays an important role in ensuring world security and peace when the world faces increasing risks and uh, serious challenges. The document can play a positive role in reducing the Ukraine crisis and preventing international strife. In fact, China's initiative document plays a key role in improving global security and preventing nuclear war. China has officially published the Global Security Initiative document and has detailed its views and principles in detail. In the document, China clarified the mechanism of cooperation and stressed China's responsibility and determination to ensure world peace. In the document, the Chinese government has provided a list of 20 main cooperation routes. This comprehensive document will also help solve the political crisis in Ukraine. The document firmly supports the security structure of governments with the centrality of the United Nations and is making a force to prevent war and rebuild after the war. The document calls on important countries to play their part in global security issues and to refuse hegemony and treat, and treat to establish peaceful coexistence. This document is for comprehensive stable security and with respect for the territorial integrity and legitimacy of all states in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. The document also emphasized that countries should be committed to peacefully resolving differences and conflicts and that differences between countries must be resolved through dialogue and consultation. China's initiative document emphasized the common future and has been welcomed and supported by more than 80 countries so far. China's foreign minister stressed that this initiative document is open and inclusive and if any country joins and sincerely wants to ensure world peace, we will support it. China calls on all countries to practice multilateralism and avoid Cold War, unilateralism and hostility. The Uh, sir, sorry, we have lost your voice. Please unmute yourself. No, it's okay. Please go ahead. Yes. Sorry, it's the, my fault. Yes, sir. The document shows that China is neutral over the Ukraine crisis and trying for establishing peace. China appears to be planning to take a mediation order between Russia and Ukraine in a strong and diplomatic initiative. China sees its relations with Ukraine as strategic. And on the other hand, Beijing and Moscow as the two largest powers in the East have friendly relations. China's role in the recent agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia is also important for the resumption of political relations. 
This agreement was welcomed by the countries of the region. Therefore, China's role in global and regional peace in increasing is increasing, and of course, it is uh, commendable. According to China's good relation with Tehran and Riyadh, it can be said that China has played an important role in reducing tensions in the Muslim world and Middle East. China's role in regional and world peace benefits all countries in the region and the international community. Security is an equal common right that every independent state should have. The initiative says, the principles of this plan are based on ethics and justice that the world needs. China's initiative is a logical solution for ending conflicts between governments and prevents the destruction of world peace. China's global security initiative is designed to maintain international peace, establish justice, common struggle against terrorism, and cross-border organized crimes. This initiative is the roadmap for cooperation on global security in the future. China's global security initiative emphasized the constructive role of regional organizations such as the African Union, ASEAN, and the Arab League in order to maintain regional stability. The final point is that China's Global Security Initiative emphasized shared security and stable peace and says that no one wins by war. No one wins by war. In the end, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan welcomes any initiative that will support global peace and security. We want to be a responsible and active member of the international community and play a positive role in supporting regional stability and global peace. The Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan has decisive decision on struggling against terrorism, removing poverty, and providing security. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Dr. Uh, Abdul Latif Nazari Saab. You are always very good and you put forward uh, problems and opportunities very beautifully. I think uh, China must be, and not only China, the world community must come forward and help you to defeat the terrorism and defeat the challenges, development challenges like food insecurity, health issues, like poverty, agriculture development, and so many challenges Afghanistan is facing at this point of time. I think China, Afghanistan can also benefit from this initiative. No, uh, unfortunately, our two speakers, they, they have to travel. One, Hassan Askri, he has to go to Iran. He promised whenever he have time and the internet access, he will join us. And our other speaker, Ms. Ebo Kani from um, uh, Indonesia, she has to go to the Portugal for some urgent meeting to signing some MOU. She is uh, uh, working with some government institution. She is trying right now to join us. And um, uh, hopefully she can uh, join us for a few minutes. But before that, as uh, we have with us, Honorable Chairman, uh, Chair of this session, Lieutenant General Retired, Naim Khaled Lodi Saab. He is a very distinguished security expert. Not only, I, I sorry, I wrote the defense, rather he is a security expert. And uh, he delivered lecture at many, many at a global level. And uh, he is a very well respected military man in Pakistan because he has a very unique thinking to solve the issues, to look to the security. I would like to request him. Meantime, he can give his comments. Sir, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. One. Thank you, Sh Shakil Ramesan, for organizing this event. Uh, am I audible to everyone because uh, the mic is slightly away? Can you hear me, other panelists? 
Okay, assuming that everybody is uh, hearing me and listening to me, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, sir, you are mute. Sir, can mute? Karo. Yes, sir. So, I have been unmuted now. So, I was uh, thanking uh, Shakib Rami Sahib for organizing this event and uh, thank you all the fellow panelists uh, to be here with us. Assalamu alaikum, uh, good afternoon, good morning, and also our uh, Chinese friend is there. So, uh, sir, greetings to everyone. Very good. So maybe now you can listen to me. Uh, more properly. I was saying uh, Assalamu Alaikum and good afternoon and good morning and good evening, depending wherever you are. Uh, so while I was going through this uh, topic, you know, uh, two things were striking. One is the security. And uh, I think most of the panelists, they have covered very well that uh, security, uh, we do not mean only the physical security, the overall well-being of the people uh, covering everything. And the other was sustainable peace. Uh, Hopefully we understand that sustainable peace does not mean a permanent peace or absence of war altogether. It only means that generally uh, in most of the world, the peace prevails. And if there are any uh, skirmishes or conflicts, those can be controlled uh, in a limited time. So that is what uh, we understand from a sustainable peace. Uh, so coming on to this uh, first the security thing that we, uh, I think that has been brought out quite uh, abundantly that uh, geo strategy geopolitics uh, and geoeconomics they are all intertwined you cannot take away one from the other so uh, as far as this chinese uh, initiative of uh, global security is concerned it is also connected with the uh, bri it is also connected with development uh, global development and all that they are all linked with each other uh, we understand that thing very well and we all understand that the vital interest for all the nations uh, for every nation is the welfare and well-being of the people uh, the only difference is here now is that the big powers uh, as somebody was saying one of the panelists that they should think big that means that uh, they should not only think about the welfare and well-being of their own people they should uh, think of the well-being of the uh, of the globe at large all the people uh, whether they are doing it or not whether they can do it or not that is uh, beside the point uh, so it is up to the big powers, uh, which approach do they adopt? Uh, a selfish approach where they only look after their own people or a more global approach, uh, which will actually bring security, not only globally, but also to their own country. Because if you, the setting is in a global, uh, you know, village. So if there's a, the globe is at ease, your own country is likely to be at ease. So that way we appreciate the initiative taken by uh, the Chinese government, uh, the way uh, they have uh, unfolded this uh, document. Uh, we have gone through, uh, you know, documents and uh, our friend from Afghanistan has uh, unfolded it very uh, elo eloquently and he has brought out all the things which were there. So uh, this, the main difference between the two philosophies uh, of two big powers, of course, one is that because of uh, unipolarity for about 20 years or more, a uh, sort of hubris has been created or uh, uh, some arrogance has come. Uh, so instead of using all the three, uh, that is geopolitics and geoeconomy and uh, 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 geostrategy, uh, they, are, they, have, they, have, they have become more used to using uh, the physical force, uh, uh, armies, uh, you know, promise and all that. And that we have seen in uh, so many places, uh, whether it is Iraq or Afghanistan or uh, Nigeria and Libya and even Syria. Uh, but but that that uh, that uh, uh, one prong approach is not working. On the other hand, the approach of Chinese approach of shared prosperity, uh, first in the neighborhood and then beyond, they are not only uh, beyond the, the, this. They have expanded it to uh, Europe and uh, Africa and uh, of course uh, the Asian neighboring countries. Uh, that is a great approach. And as they say that good is sustainable. Good is more permanent as compared to evil. 
so uh, i think that this uh, approach is likely to uh, create uh, uh, sustainable uh, feelings all around the uh, globe <clears throat> now for pakistan uh, because uh, i need to talk to, uh, about my own country also one of the panelists also brought out that uh, for the time being uh, the global uh, state is in a flux because uh, this unipolarity is transforming into multipolarity or bipolarity we'll we'll have to see how it happens uh, so there's a problem for countries like pakistan that which way to go because it is not very certain that uh, how the world is going to shape up after a decade or more or even five years but it doesn't mean that we do we we stop uh, our foreign policy or we stop taking initiatives or we stop thinking uh, we can always project uh, the events and i think it is amply clear uh, that uh, very soon uh, already the world has become uh, multipolar and uh, the strong poles will are already challenging uh, the unipolarity the hegemony of uh, one uh, power and now i think uh, we have we, we are in a good position to project the things and make decisions for ourselves but before taking decisions what should we be considering i am not talking from the pakistan's point of view we must keep the history of relations in mind i mean we have been uh, having relations with one uh, superpower and the other big power and we have seen that ups and downs in relations and on one side we have seen no downs in the relations it has been uh, strengthening year after year so it makes it quite easy for us to uh, make a decision uh, which way to go then is the geography the location uh, naturally if you are connected to a country and connected to a big power it, it is much more profitable to uh, ally yourself with them rather than to ally with a distant power although i do understand uh, that once the power can be projected the distances do not matter but still geography plays a very vital role uh, so we need to keep that factor also in mind uh, then the geopolitical considerations the whole the, the shift which is taking place uh, we know that after after losing the continental uh, space in afghanistan uh, burma uh, bangladesh and even pakistan uh, united states has, has embarked upon uh, your second line of defense in um, uh, you know pacific region uh, pacific indo region in the form of uh, quads and quads plus they may even be thinking of their third line of defense uh, 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 in aukus and uh, things like that so uh, uh, they are they are they, they are receding as far as the things and china is expanding uh, not on the basis of any hegemony but because of this shared uh, uh, prosperity concept and uh, people are welcoming uh, them all over the world even we have seen that middle eastern countries who are so Uh, deeply linked with uh, 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 super superpower america they have also now cultured good relations with china and russia and although uh, america has already um, engaged russia uh, thinking that russia is likely to be one of the emerging partners of china uh, uh, probably they have uh, that is also the engagement of russia is also indirectly related with china and they have also tried to provoke china at least twice as far as taiwan is concerned but i must uh, say kudos for chinese that they they are just continuing uh, their own trajectory and they are not being uh, you know uh, uh, there's no uh, their their focus is uh, still there but i must uh, caution my chinese friends that as they say that you may not be interested in war but war may be interested in you whereas it is good that you are trying to avoid war for and you should you must do it for as long as possible but you must keep in mind that war is not only one sided uh, desire so to, uh, uh, to keeping in mind all this i think uh, the option for pakistan is quite obvious and it is uh, quite vivid and clear there should be no ambiguity i am amazed actually uh, to see uh, the dilly dallying of the uh, present regime uh, that they have not yet made up their mind that which way to go you know the best of course policy is to have a balance and try to have good relations with everyone but if that becomes not impossible which i think uh, uh, it is becoming quite difficult for us uh, today so we must make our decision uh, that uh, look at the direction of the world look at the uh, 
uh, attitude of uh, various parts and uh, also our past and ge geography, it's very clear that Pakistan will have to have uh, strategic relations. Already we have strategic relations, deep relations. We need to reinforce them with China and with the East, with Central Asian countries, with Russia. I have no doubts about that. So in my opinion, to ensure sustainable peace in the region and beyond, Pakistan should solidly decide to join shared prosperity concept, uh, which is the Chinese concept, and cultivate strategic relations with China and good, good relations with Afghanistan, Iran, Central Asian countries, Middle East, Turkey, and even India. And why not United States, uh, if, if, if that is possible? So the, the, I think uh, the common interest should also be seen while having relations with countries. While once we talk of Iran and Afghanistan and uh, Kashmir and uh, the CPAC and development of Gwadar, so we, we, we need to see that uh, which is the country which has shared interest with us uh, much more than any other country. Uh, so here I will end my discourse and I would like to uh, appreciate uh, all the panelists. And I have taken a few notes uh, from whatever they said. And I think it was very interesting. Uh, before I say thank you to all of you, I think I must uh, br bring out what all was being said. Uh, uh, Mr. S uh, Stephen from Sweden, I think he brought out this a very uh, good concept that economy is not only in terms of money, there's a physical concept of economy also once we talk of production uh, and all that. And I think uh, he, he also appreciated the uh, Chinese initiative. And uh, I think most of the speakers also uh, connected the all the three, four Chinese initiatives uh, about development, about security, about BRI. And I think they are also to, uh, bringing us something about shared civilizations and all that. Uh, Madam Helga uh, brought out uh, the two approaches, which I also uh, talked about that the big powers, they have the option of uh, having one of the two approaches, a hegemonic approach, where because of their greatness and big, uh, you know, uh, footprint, they can uh, cow down uh, countries, or the shared approach, shared prosperity approach, uh, I think, uh, which was, uh, and uh, she said that emergent conference must be carried out to um, uh, think on all these uh, lines and uh, try to reduce uh, all the conflicts which are which are going on. <clears throat> our, our friend from Afghanistan, uh, Latif Nazari Saab, he he he. Uh, I think uh, we must be all very grateful to him that because he brought out all the features of the document of this uh, 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 global security initiative or Chinese document. We had read it all right, but still he reiterated many aspects, and I think that was good. And uh, uh, Madam from uh, Malaysia, uh, no, T. Keith, sorry, from Malaysia, he talked about development and security. They go together. As we were saying, I think uh, this is the concept that you cannot uh, separate them. And he also said that other regional initiatives uh, like ASEAN and SEO, et cetera, should also be embraced in this concept. And I think that is uh, what the Chinese are thinking also. And uh, Miss Julia, uh, from Russia, I think uh, she, she said that, uh, what I was also saying that the changing world order is still in flux. It has not yet acquired that final shape, uh, but the, uh, the, the contours are there. So instead of waiting for the things to settle down, which may take time, I think uh, uh, the world must stand for the right, uh, for, for the truth. And uh, that can, uh, you know, and she also said that Power, you know, power doesn't only mean that you have uh, a lot of money and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, wherewithal, physical wherewithal for, to make uh, war. Power also is thinking big. I think she, this is a very big, uh, good point which she brought. So at the end, I will thank all of you uh, for taking out your time and uh, all those who are listening to us online. Uh, now I don't know if there's any question answer session, so we can continue with that. Thank you very much. I think uh, I should thank you, uh, Lieutenant General Retired Nai Kale Lodi Saab. So what I said, he proved that. So he he is a very different person from the military, have the military background, but about the security and its importance, he is a very different person. Thank you, sir. From all the discussion which we are listening and hearing, I think one thing is very clear, which I always maintain 
which I always say we should stick to. So power should be used as a deterrence, not as a threat. So power should be used as a deterrence to fight back evil, not as a threat to capture the resources or capture the spaces of other. So I think the concept of power as a deterrence, not as a threat, that should be the main, I think, the low, uh, motto that should lead the world now. Where we can use the power, keep the power as a deterrence, if unforeseen forces like non-traditional security threat, if you're talking about uh, organized crime, non-traditional security threats, organized crimes, terrorism, or other bad elements, we should have the power so we can deter and we can uh, face them. But it should not be like that to create the hegemonic like a threat. Because due to the threat, we have faced so many challenges. The conflict which are prevailing all across the world. So the hegemonic aspiration and all other things. I think that is a very good message and we have a very good uh, uh, debate here. But to benefit from the, all the panelists, I will not let you go very soon. So <laughs> I will first I would like to put a question to Madam Helga. Maybe there are some younger students who wants to know. So we talk about the big things, like whenever an initiative is being launched, we talk about all the positive. But should there be any parameters how we can judge, it will really contribute to the aim, what has been said. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that, uh, I think you mentioned that in the very beginning, that the problems mankind faces right now are enormous. I mean, two billion people have no access to clean water. Uh, according to the World Food Program, there are almost 1.7 billion people who are food insecure and are actually threatened with starvation. Uh, the pandemic has shown that you know countries who do not have a modern health system had a much harder time to defend their populations. So <clears throat> I think that the idea of the combination of the Global Security Initiative and the Global Development Initiative, that they must be taken together. And frankly, you know, I mean, what I try to say in my remarks is, you know, this is not taking place in a vacuum, but this is taking place in a very traumatic uh, moment where <clears throat> the turmoil on the financial markets in the United States and Europe they will, will affect the emerging markets because you know once they increase the interest rate in the United States and in Europe, you will have capital flight out of the uh, countries from the global south. And you know, so we are all sitting in one boat. And I think this is something new because in former times you could have parts of the world having a crisis, you know, like the Roman Empire collapsed and people in Asia would not find out until many years later, because it took many years to travel. Um, but this time, you know, we are for the first time in one boat. We have nuclear weapons, and if it comes to a nuclear war, it will be the extinction of all of civilization. We have the internet, which makes, you know, everything connected. Um, we have pandemics, which can affect the whole globe. And you could list many more of such uh, things which make us interconnected. And this is why I think, you know, we really have to understand that we have to have a solution right now, which takes into account the interest of every single country on the planet. This is why the Schiller Institute has been proposing a new global security and development architecture, which, you know, really does that. And the reference point is historically the Peace of Westphalia, which established after 150 years of religious war in Europe, exactly that principle that any peace solution must take into account the interest of everybody or else it does not work. And I think this is the big challenge because, you know, we have to overcome geopolitics because as long as we have the interest of a group of nations against the interest of another group of nations, we still are in the domain of the risk of world war. And that is why I think the Chinese initiative comes at an extremely important point. And I think the fact that they managed to uh, you know, settle the conflict uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran is a very hopeful sign that that method can be applied anywhere on the globe. So these are my initial thoughts. 
Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. And uh, now the second question is for Miss Julia. So as Russia talked uh, so many times at different points for the need of the new global money or the global standard of the money. So the question is, as right now, the dollar has been securitized. Economy has been securitized. So how Russia want to promote this new concept of the money which cannot be securitized and assist China to promote that through the GSI? Thank you for your question. Oh, well, unfortunately, I'm not an economist quite, so I don't exactly understand how this works. But perceptionally, uh, I believe that um, Russia has currently been expressing support to Chinese initiatives uh, per se. So like Russia has been numerously stating that uh, Chinese vision of both the, dollariz the dollarization processes and security processes like security initiative uh, is sometimes somewhat in tune with uh, what Russia is proposing itself. So I think that for Russia and China, the BRICS institutions, BRICS uh, monetary institutions will be the emphasis and like the foundational point where the countries could together promote their agenda because uh, actually new development bank of the BRICS was exactly established uh, to push this agenda forward into the G20 and uh, uh, world financial institutions. So uh, I think that this will stay the same because this is like the most uh, viable platform that both countries might use. And other platforms where Russia and China share ground like uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and bilateral forums and meetings will probably uh, also be used, but not for monetary purposes, of course, because they're not economic in their essence, but like for discussing and uh, maybe coming up with uh, joint solutions to put forward further through BRICS or other institutions like the UN. Thank you, Ms. Julia. Although this was not very much related to the security, but somebody put in, so I thought I should ask because there is a lot of, uh, we, lot of uh, we hear a lot about the Chinese uh, uh, Russians when they're talking about, so there should be some new money standard, so which should not be securitized in a future. So that is good thing. Mr. Chonglu, do you want to say anything before going for the next question? Oh, you just want to be the silent listener. So no problem. So next question is for Mr. Stephen. Stephen, to talk about uh, uh, physical economy. So the question is, when putting so much unrealistic, you can say, uh, barrier to the production facilities in the Europe, like for so called sometimes to go uh, too much on the, this environment and these things. So how you can bring back the production to that area if and no, the environment has been tagged to the security. So how this security can be tackled and the both can work together. So you are, please unmute. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that from the standpoint that environmentalism is focused on the kind of developments around the clean air and clean water, uh, which China has actually focused on in terms of its own uh, <clears throat> improvements of the environment. Uh, even generally, this is clearly uh, something important in terms of physical economy. Uh, however, the problem is that uh, when we are looking at what is the dominant view of uh, the, the coming out of the Davos economic meeting is a form of environmentalism that is in the West directly connected to neo-Malthusianism, which is basically uh, a a policy that emerges out of the imperial policy of the old and to a certain de a, a clear degree, the present imperial policy of, of the Anglo-American uh, system, which has uh, been called the unipolar world. <clears throat> but as long as that system, which is based on uh, uh, a, a policy of looting, and internally is disintegrating, not only financially, but 
directly inform in terms of its own infrastructure, uh, physical economy. Uh, the United States is uh, in abysmal condition. Sweden is also going very badly backwards because of a failure to invest in the necessary uh, infrastructure in forms of mo more modern transport uh, and uh, electrical power. And the general direction which dominates the thinking in the Western side of the world is not based on the principles of physical economy. I can uh, certainly endorse the idea of Mrs. LaRouche to pull together a world discussion on economic policy uh, or financial, but I think the underlying point has to be on the significance of physical economy, which the Western side of the world, the United States, in the name of a kind of environmental neo-Malthusian neo -Malthusian idea, has abandoned. And in that process, they have been using this idea of a rules-based order to impose their thinking, their policies on the rest of the world or attempting to, I think unsuccessfully. Uh, the danger of course is still uh, the risk of an escalation uh, in maybe even the conflict in Ukraine to a conflict that could involve the use of nuclear weapons, which would be uh, a, a disaster for the entire globe. But the point is what the Global Security Initiative takes up, uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, both sovereignty, this is what essentially underlined the agreement between Iran and uh, Afghanistan, I'm sorry, Iran and Saudi Arabia. The point was sovereignty, the respect for internal uh, decisions, that is not intervening into internal affairs. And finally, the idea that economic cooperation is ultimately the foundation for peace. Now, those principles apply to virtually any conflict, even the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine, which is a complicated situation, but ultimately, uh, the, the conflict has to be resolved in a diplomatic form of some type, because that is in the only interest in Ukraine, it's in the interest of Russia, it's in the interest of mankind. And uh, the, res the re reluctance to resolve this in diplomatic forms is a danger to, to, to all people. But the underlying factor of physical economy, I can just say that the Belt and Road is already one of the key nodal points. Uh, there are actually two that are fundamentally right now emerging. One which Mrs. LaRouche mentioned, which is the Southern route through Istanbul in Turkey. The other one is through Belarus, through Minsk. And <clears throat> the fact that President Lukashenko was presently or very recently meeting in China, is because China sees the industrial park that has been developed in Belarus, which is a key part of the Belt and Road, as a key part of the uh, development of cooperation economically on the planet. I think that's the uh, direction we have to continue to go. There will be uh, in my view, dramatic changes, as, as, as Mrs. LaRouche has also mentioned, that this is a very dramatic period in history. Uh, I think the potential to embrace new ideas, which do reflect a community for a shared future for mankind, are present. Uh, I, I think that it might even be an interesting discussion. May, eventually, I might have with Mrs. Ju Ms. Julia about the uh, uh, involvement of Russia, uh, although they are clearly working in the context of the, the BRICS, the, uh, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, these agreements are also emerging 
as the basis for global cooperation in economic terms. We have to make, uh, uh, hopefully, some dramatic changes in the in the policy making that is coming from Western Europe and the and the United States, uh, which is unfortunately a military neo Malthusian perspective. Uh, it won't work. It's incompetent. It won't lead to their own economic benefits but it can threaten obviously the rest of the world just as the Roman Empire did when it was disintegrated. So they are disintegrating, but <clears throat> I look for a, a, in my work as a optimistic positive basis for how we can redefine physical economy and environmentalism in the proper term of modernization of infrastructure. Uh, and not some idea that we have to uh, limit the number of, of people in the world or uh, that the resources that the world has cannot supply the necessary uh, support for the, for the uh, world economy. And in that light, the former husband of uh, uh, the deceased husband of Mrs. LaRouche, Lyndon LaRouche, has uh, written uh, a very important book, So You Wish to Learn All About Economics, which could be, I think, a foundation for the kind of discussion that should be taken up in the international context. Because that is a very clear, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging philosophical document, but it involves economy in precisely the light that uh, we have been talking about. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, a short intervention here. Sure, Thanks. sure, sure. Mr. Brower, yeah, I actually agree with you here that uh, we should uh, promote something more constructive for, rather than only geopolitical um, vibe. But as for economy, actually, today's situation is pushing for the countries, especially Russia and China, especially Russia, to reconsider how the financial transactions are made. And probably there might be something coming out of this, because today, in order to promote cooperation with Asian countries and with the countries of the global south, Russia needs to find these new methods and solutions of how the financial transactions might be uh, secured and prevented from either secondary sanctions from the United States and Western countries or from global regime, right, that are actually opposed to these transactions today. So uh, if this search uh, is successful and if it finds uh, some successful uh, mode uh, of how it might operate, then post-conflict we can probably see something coming out of it, like something absolutely new, like some more secure, some more independent viable transaction mechanisms, at least in this domain. Thank you, Ms. Julia. And uh, we, I think we are about to finish. And uh, Dr. Abdul Latif Nazari, if you are here, you can hear me. I think the most important thing uh, which uh, we all must uh, try to strive for is the policy, any initiative should not be confined to the self-interest. It should be talking about the other people's interest. Those theories can work. If we say, like there is a, there is a saying, so when we talk about the win-win cooperation or the win-win diplomacy, it means interest of both parties should be uh, protected. I was talking to a Chinese diplomat a few years back. I asked him, why you are talking about this? Always win-win. He said, look, today, if I am powerful, I can grab the resources of other country. But if tomorrow that country become powerful, they will come after me. So the wise policy is don't make anybody your enemy when you are in a power. So try to create the joint working. So with these all remarks, I would like to thank you all for your wonderful contribution. I think I will engage you again because there were a few IR students and IR teachers who were also joining us and watching live in, um, uh, on uh, Facebook and they were, uh, sorry, they have uh, in their class. So they were requesting me uh, two things very specifically they are requested. One, they want to know more about Russia and the Russia stance. And they're asking me if we can have a lecture from Miss Julia. So how the Russia is evolving in the new era. So Julia, I will come back to you. Okay, then, thank you.
Then the second thing is they also like the ideas from the Madam Helga. So maybe we have to again request the Madam Helga. So in the future, maybe we request you of a lecture for the students. And lastly, before we are leaving, so our last uh, speaker, she has joined. Ma Madam Abokani Rabake, she is a executive director of Maritime Study Center of Indonesia. And she is a, a very well, she is a very well known, uh, she is a very well known scholar on the maritime issues. She works closely with the government of uh, Indonesia. And right now she is in Portugal. She was there to sign uh, some MOUs with the government to government's MOU. But from the meeting, she came out just to talk about that. And I know this, they still have to sign those document, documents, but after that, she, she will go back. So Madam, you can quickly, if you can you give your point of view, please unmute yourself. Uh, good morning, uh, <laughs> all the very uh, respected panelists. Uh, good morning for uh, Mr. Helga, Madam Helga, Mr. Stephen Brewer, and all these, uh, Ms. Pa Shekel Ahmad Ramai uh, in the Asian Institute and everyone. I'm really sorry that I have to be a bit rushed because I'm in Lisbon now, is still signing our agreement with uh, Portuguese in Indonesia. Because this uh, uh, seminar is very, uh, or Zoominar uh, from the uh, Civil Institute is very important, then I excuse myself and I like to share my uh, piece of thinking. So I may uh, start uh, directly to the to the uh, things that I wanna discuss. First is uh, what is that we have to achieve and how to achieve the uh, the, the uh, concrete and faster sustainable peace. And I think that's the most important thing I just want to say, because I think uh, the wake up call is uh, happened since last year when we, we saw the hard power still uh, have the real effect and matters in the world politics and that we cannot uh, simply let uh, defense capabilities uh, 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 a trophy for, for, for several decades because we think we never need them. And then we how this uh, this uh, uh, I'm sorry to, to, to say this, but I, I, I call it the U United States Uber Alice policy and strategy that happened to, to, to the whole world that, uh, that we cannot prevent uh, US and the alliance from uh, doing something suicidal for example and how we have to 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 be uh, very concerned especially me because we are living in uh southeast asia and in the pacific how we are really uh, afraid, afraid that this uh, movie of the world will be into asia uh, i'm going to share my slide anyway so i'm just will i just will to be very uh, you know uh, fast for this so for situation that we have today on march 2023 at the long run i think russia will prevail Battle of Bahmut is the pivot point that controlling Bahmut by controlling Bahmut, Russia will uh, succeeding uh, future deployment on deeper into Ukraine territories, and Wagner Group and Russian uh, forces already uh, sitting the city and clearing uh, the city today, and the battle for victory on my thinking will be on the Russian uh, side soon. So this unsustainability and the delayed support of U.S. and Russian will be complete with a sustainable resource and production of military equipment. Uh, on, in my thinking, I think Russia is helped uh, silently by its ally or friends. Uh, and when we have some problem as well, that US banking system, we know this week, uh, collapse. And uh, this is not the first time, 2008, they are collapsed, 2006, they are collapsed, and now it's collapsed again. And the flow of systemic uh, can control the high speculation nature of the U.S. thinking system in this volatile, uncertain, and dynamic world. So U.S. was an economic indicate by the rising of interest rate by the Fed, okay, uh, and uh, how the bleeding on its uh, oil reserve. Europe energy, uh, for, uh, no, we know it's addicted to Russian energy, and you, Europe uh, still having uh, energy import from Russia, which is uh, maybe doing very quietly, although the North Stream have been hijacked and sabotaged by the U.S., I think, uh, uh, you know, with the U.S. Uh, Uber has interest into everything, that is going to be uh, to be uh, very dangerous to the near future of not only the world but especially the Europe. In fact, the direct uh, for or indirect import from the sea are not be stopped, and uh, because of that, uh, in the income is uh, in hard currency still come to Russia and other energy source such as uranium. We know that uh, Russia still send uh, uranium because uh, uh, U.S. As for the uranium and uh, the excuse from us because it's not on that uh, sanctions so this is a uh, very funny actually 
Ah, the chip. Uh, the things that we are going to uh, uh, think is about the chip that depleted by asking to Taiwan to stop supplying uh, Russia on uh, how Taiwan respond to cut high end microprocessor export to Russia and Belarus. And this chip limitation, I think, will uh, affect something as as I know that Russia is not an uh, easy country to to you know to 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 be weakened because uh, this will actually will accelerate the lithography development of Russia that always uh, find a way to technical solution on producing the same technology, technology by, by their own. And this is going to be the top priority of Russia uh, on my reset. And I think uh, uh, Russia will have, a, 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 you know, a rest, fun a strong basic science and a knowledge to you know, to create this and if this is happen it means the global world will have new alternative for high tech microprocessors and going for a new threat of chip industry global domination which is now uh, doing by a uh, us uh, nato allies and taiwan and indo pacific is very complicated area with diverse uh, characteristic because we have geopolitical and superior rivalry we have heavy alliance mil militarized we have complex overlapping uh, countries interest national interest and Taiwan, and uh, I think it's going to be the next war uh, for uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine excuse uh, of NATO and US to exit, uh, to, uh, to exit from a Europe uh, problem. And the South China Sea uh, dispute is designated as a boiling point. I think it's by design as well. So it, either Taiwan or uh, South China Sea is going to be uh, the, the hardest point, even though I saw the CNN just now said it's not Korea, issue is higher as well. The growing overlapping coalition of the willing or coalition of the guard into our region, into Indo-Pacific is going to be dangerous as well, because at the same time, the regional have a problem of ignorance. And we have, I think what we call stagnation of the non-alignment movement. Okay. So this is, I just uh, give you a very small example of how France, because France actually is coming uh, with their, uh, with their uh, reason, uh, reason of defending their country and their territory. But look at uh, France does here, uh, the very uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, on, uh, no, sorry, in New Caledonia, New Zealand, Australia, and the rest. But you can see they emphasize everything around South China Sea instead of on the East China Sea or uh, near uh, somewhere near Taiwan. Uh, if you, if I can mention in this small map, it's only simple. How uh, this thing can fastly change to become a very strong alliance? Because if France join with U.S. indo pacific Comprehensive, the Quad, the FPDA, the AUKUS, then things in, happen in Ukraine will be happen either one in Taiwan first, in South China Sea first, or maybe in our region Papua. So the real reason for South China Sea conflicts, I think, is only about energy. You can see here, uh, for example, 7.7 billion barrels of oil discovered as a reserve. 10% of global fish is there, and heavy global uh, airspace traffic, and how metric and how uh, uh, how many uh, cubic trillion tons of uh, gas uh, resource uh, sorry uh, tons of resource of gas is there, and the maritime traffic and so on. So I think the reason is this. It's not only about the historical, historical claim. I'm now here in this meeting. I'm uh, standing in the uh, uh, building of National Aircraft of Portugal. They have aircraft since ninth century. I think the oldest aircraft they have. So we can, if we are uh, going to be very honest, the claiming, claiming history of Tayo, uh, China into the Nandes line around South China Sea, it can be solved only by the map and by the aircraft. But again, the U.S. overall policy doesn't allow us to do that. And that's why the world is quiet. So I just want to remind us, uh, you know, the Ukraine and, 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 and Russia war is very small because Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine GDP, if we just mix it, it's only one seven trillion. But if we allow uh, the U.S. overall attitude going to uh, China and Taiwan, you know, or whatever it uh, start uh, the war uh, with, then it's going to 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 involve the amount very big and go the, the, this is the real collapse of the world economy because 12 trillion the gdp of china plus 650 billion gdp of uh, taiwan will be you know shaking the world comparing this one 7.7 trillion so the danger and immediate solution by non-alignment global movement this is what i wish first the unthinkable china iran and arab saudi is previously divided by u.s foreign policy to strengthen the petrodollar the global the dollarization will be uh, going uh, big i think the movement and the logical consequence of the uh, usd often fairness now uh, uh, this is about my last presentation the danger of next unification 
of FPDA, AUKUS, the Quad, and the NATO countries' military capability in Asia is actually very, very dangerous. As I mentioned to you in the map that I show you from the uh, example from the French capability in our region. So I hope the non-alignment movement grow, uh, should be uh, not only uh, the movement that we have now, but the global movement should be created. And I think uh, Madam Helga uh, can um, uh, deepening this uh, point uh, and how we should speed faster, especially going to the real point of Asia Africa movement and Bandung spirit, which is eradicate all defense alliances, alliance as the main key. Because if we can eradicate all the defense alliance from all around the world, I think the world is going to be the better place and thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm really sorry. Again, I wish, I wish, I wish I really can has discussed something with Madam Helga, with Mr. Stephen Bauer, with everybody here. But I have to excuse myself because I'm about to signing something. So again, Pa Ahmad Ramai, uh, I'm looking forward to have another meeting with a Shifa Institute as well, and then maybe in the proper time, and I, I can just uh, discuss a lot. Again, thank you, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. I think uh, we must be thankful to you. You spare your time. We can understand you are busy. And especially when you are an official assignment. Yes, official, so yes, then, yes. Then it is a very difficult <laughs> to spare the time. But thank you so much. I think uh, participants have enjoyed your uh, presentation. Okay. And uh, we will love to hear you again. But right yes. now we are concluding because we already had a concluding remark. We just yes. chip in at the time. Otherwise, we will be just leaving. Okay. And uh, thank you so much to the speaker, to Madam Helga, to Ms. Julia, uh, Mr. Stephen Brewer, and uh, Dr. Abdul Latif Mazari, and Nazari, and Lieutenant General. Naim Khaleludi Sahab, he is sitting here with us for all the time, although he is not feeling well, but oh, okay. he drive for one hour to reach here just to be here at the time. Okay. And thank you so much, sir, for coming. And uh, hopefully we can build some good yes. momentum from yes. this conference and from this webinar so we can design to have some forum where we can deliberate, we can make a forum. Maybe Madam Helga can take a lead on that because she is a used to and she is leading so much so many successful and I yes think we can jo join hands and i'm personally very much interested because i'm working on asia pacific for a very long time so i was looking the partner with whether we can collaborate so to make it asia pacific asia pacific Okay. Not just the new exercise <laughs> of power showing or something like okay. that. So, thank you. So thank much, you. Yeah. And I excuse myself as well. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. See you again soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.